This is the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo, giving you the inside track on all the big talking points from Anfield. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Blood Red podcast live from the Echo offices. Big day for the boss, Jürgen Klopp, today as he welcomes back 14 senior stars, including the new men, Soboslai and McAllister, but an even bigger day for me, your host Sean Bradbury, as I welcome <laughs> Paul Ghost and Theo Squires to... Uh, like this pod, how are we chaps, Ghosty? You getting on okay? Yeah, all good. Um, feels like pre-season's properly starting now, doesn't it, with the, uh, the big names back. So Boz like there as you, as you flawlessly pronounce them, um, <laughs> and McAllister. So we're going to get into them a little bit, aren't we? But it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see how they get on over the next few weeks. Obviously big step-ups for them in terms of moving to a club like Liverpool. So yeah, it just feels like everything's ticking along quite nicely at the moment. Absolutely, and Theo, how I think it's taking along for you. You all good? Yeah, all good. Pretty much more ghostly, so isn't it? It feels like it's really starting now. Excited to see uh, those first clips we'll get of the new men on uh, mm. social media later today uh, for all the talk of our Liverpool being a bit slouchy in the pre season in terms of getting the transfers in. The fact that they have got those two midfielders in right for the start of pre season is a big positive. And now it's only, what, two, three senior players who aren't actually back with the camp? Yeah. So, yeah, it, the hard work starts here. Come to you first, Gosti. I mean, as 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 you guys have said, the the, the big guys are back. The, the the new signings are there, and as they alluded to there, you know, we heard from Klopp to me a few weeks ago, wanting a couple of names in for the start of pre season. Well, yeah. well, well, that's done. You know, the, uh, the the clips we've seen so far, everyone seems positive. I thought Klopp especially that that little vid of him just arriving. He just looked like he was absolutely buzzing. You know, we've yeah. seen yeah. Nunes and his snippets of English telling everyone the holiday is finished now, and you know the hard work starts. What is your sense of, of the mood in the camp? Do you think there was a genuine bit of optimism building up? Yeah, very much so. I, I wrote, wrote something to that effect, actually, in the, the Blood Red column last week. It just feels like there's a little bit of optimism growing at the moment because Liverpool have, obviously, everyone knew they'd be went into the summer needing a major overhaul of the midfield. And that was a bit of an open secret by the end of the season, wasn't it? So the fact that they've got Zabozlai and McAllister in before okay, Zabozlai fixed his arm, is it July the 2nd? But... Triggered his release clause at the end of June, and he so they, they put a lot of groundwork in across June before pre season started. It's already the biggest spend in the summer for five years, and um, it could even mm. eclipse that by the end of it. We're going to get into late transfer targets a bit later on, aren't we? But yeah, it just feels like um, the disappointments of last season is forgotten, and um, the mood is very much an optimistic one. We'll see what happens over the coming weeks and, and months, of course, but I just get the feeling that. It's a bit of a happy camp at the moment. Um, Klopp uses this time, doesn't need to get everyone ready. It's, it's very much his time in terms of time on the training pitch, which he doesn't normally get during the season, you know, especially if they're pool playing two or three times a week. Um, and I think the fact that they've changed the itinerary for the summer is massive as well. The fact mm. that I think last season they, they flew to Thailand first and then Singapore and then went to um, was it Austria. Um, and they... The pre-season programme wasn't what Klopp wanted. I think there's been a very concerted effort to, to flip that around this summer to make sure that they're getting the players as fit as possible, as early as possible. And then, obviously, the hope is that they avoid injuries further down the line as a result. Because I think during the summer, I mean, between mid-July and August last season, the Villa had injuries to John Matip, Jordan Henderson, Allison, Jota, Oxlade-Chamberlain, Cater, Thiago. So lessons are definitely looking to be learned this summer from that and hopefully that is the case. Theo, how, how do you see it? What's your sense so far? Because you know, it, it does feel quite exciting at this point, doesn't it? And that Liverpool are ready to rectify some of the things that went wrong last summer and into last season. And you know, not only are we, are we seeing all the, the, the big names return today and, and the new recruits, there's been quite a few younger faces who've, who've cropped up and been seen in training to kind of like test themselves against the senior guys you know do you, do you think it's it is the pre-season starting on the right foot at this point yeah I do if you think about how the last few years have been Liverpool haven't had the ideal pre-season when you think of Covid pandemic or a mid-season World Cup so mm. they have to start early when they'd had a quadruple push the season before and had to finish late they haven't had just a normal summer break for what since they won the Champions League going into the Premier League yeah. season so that's a long stretch for professional athletes to lose that rhythm when you think these are players that are so stuck in routine year after year, have your holiday, start your pre-season, do it all in the right way to get them to the absolute top physical condition so then they can go into the season. And Liverpool, when you think how the work rate, the pressing and all these sorts of numbers, physicality comes mm-hmm. into it, when they haven't got it 100%, 
that's sometimes lacking on the pitch. So it is crucial for them to get it all back together, back to basics from day one for pre-season here. Transfer-wise, you look at it, when they've tried to strengthen the squad in attack, especially in the past 18 months, two years, it's been one signing at a time, summer by summer. You think Diaz, then Nunes, then Gakpo. This is this big effort to, we need a new midfield here. So to have that built from day one so they can get these relationships going, they're going as well. Joking there on my own. It's <laughs> <I laughs> pure excitement. It comes out in yeah. different ways. But it is building this new look midfield. And sometimes it takes time to settle. Like if Spotify is looking a little bit slow or McAllister's not quite up to scratch, you'd expect to see a Henderson or a Curtis Jones start in the opening weeks of the season. But this is a new look midfield along with Fabinho. And you have to have that up to scratch. Whereas in the past, we've seen players like Fabinho taking a little bit longer and you haven't needed to put them straight into the starting 11 so that's why it's crucial to have them all in from now so they can get to work forge these relationships go to Germany together go to Singapore together and just even more get the team camaraderie going mm. obviously it looks positive well, from what we're seeing on social media from what the club are putting out Klopp just looked like he had a weight lifted off his shoulders and yeah. he was so really relaxed nice. so just glad to be back as well obviously that 11 game unbeaten run helped and then it's always an exciting time at the start of each pre-season where the youngsters do get to go because a few of them will get appearances during the season. Like we saw Pesetic just burst onto the scene last year, probably ahead of schedule. Like if it wasn't for injuries, I don't think he'd have played as much as he did last year. Mm. But this is a, a new opportunity for a number of youngsters. I'm sure everyone's excited to see what Ben Doak can do. He didn't get a pre-season with the first team last year because he'd only just joined the club. You look at a few of the others there. I think Lewis Kumas is the only under-18s player who's training with the first team at the moment but he had a really impressive season last year played by injury a little bit but he scored a lot of goals uh, I think he scored four on the opening day of the season didn't he and that was like his first game as a striker oh, yeah. competitively yeah, yeah. and it, he didn't look back there um, I think it's something like he scored pretty much every game he played or uh, Premier League 18s he broke into the 21s a little bit so while you maybe wouldn't expect him to be with the first team properly as the season gets underway this is a great chance for him to you know get those first few appearances He's got good uh, football blood in his uh, body as well. We think Jason Kumas, his son, another Merseyside player of yesteryear. Uh, but there's a, a few youngsters there that like, we'll look to see more from like Harvey Blair. Remember him making his debut against Preston North End. He's had a few injuries since then, but for when you see him at academy level, there's that excitement there when he does get going that he can push on again. This is that platform for all to state the claim in front of Klopp, in front of Pep Linders, and in front of their new senior teammates. This is it. Go uh, see with the people we've talked about so far, you know, the, the, the new recruits and everyone who's there, if if the window ceased here in terms of incomings, yeah. would you be okay with that? Do you think Klopp's got enough to, to build on as things stand? You know, as we said, he, he was he was excited to get things underway and have the key the key elements in place by this point. And I think, you know, that's, if you look back at what happened at the, end, the back end of last season with the, the switch to the new midfield system, mm. these guys are the ones, for me personally, where you thought, McAllister and Sabaz, like two players who can play in those more advanced roles in that system. That's that's the key element that could change. You know, they can lead the press and just transform what a Liverpool midfield can do. Good technical players who can, you know, receive the ball between the lines and, and just make a real difference. Do you feel like that's that's the important part done? But if, if it was just that, how how would you feel going into the new campaign? Yeah, I mean it's it, it's a it's a great start, but it's only a start, I think. Um I think if Liverpool do stick with this new kind of box midfield formation, it's a, a lot more um, taxing on the centre backs, and I think Liverpool mm. will need another another defender in there due to that. I think Canate is probably the ideal profile you want to play on that right. Um, Van Dijk can play down the middle, but then it's it's that left side, isn't it? I'm not totally convinced that Andy Robertson can do that long term. Yeah, I'd have reservations over Joe Gomez starting on the left side, and and I'd have. Probably more with John Matip starting there, to be honest. So um, it's a great start, McAllister and Zabozla. I think Liverpool have, you know, hopefully eradicated the Achilles heel that was in the squad last season. But if it was to be done and dusted with just those two, I think Liverpool are still leaving themselves short. Um, at least a centre back needed, and, and I'm open to another midfielder as well, if I'm being honest. Um, another more defensive minded midfielder, because I'm not too sure. What Fabinho's current lay of the land is? Hard is he is he over the the worst of his form? Is is the worst of his form now kind of his level, or can he get back to the levels he, he was at in the first two seasons at Liverpool? Big question marks around him. So, um, well, I'm delighted with what Liverpool have done so far. I still think 
more will, will be needed. Mm. So on that point, Theo, I was, I was listening to a show the other day with Josh Williams on uh, Distance Covered to his friends or Distance <laughs> Dave to, to <laughs> some <laughs> side of the Echo office. And, and he made the point about McAllister and Savar's lie that if you'd have, let, let's say you wind the clock back to January, February, you know, the, the, the point before Klopp made the formation change. He said, like, if, if, if it was those two players that Liverpool had signed initially and, and first and foremost as the big summer signings, there would have been a bit of concern because, you know, under the old 4 3 3, you know, the traditional Klopp system, it, it really did look like it needed an injection of like legs and energy, didn't it? Perhaps new number six, of course, he said, you know, someone to compete with, possibly even replace Fabinho. But it, the, the formation change did put a bit of a different slant on it. Are you kind of satisfied that the main things are done or like Gorsley and I'd certainly agree with this do you feel more is needed from this point? Uh, more is definitely needed defensively if this is the box formation that's what they're sticking with you can't have four centre-backs to cover three positions I know Andy yeah. Robertson is sort of doing it but all four of the senior lads got injuries last year yeah. we've seen Liverpool left short two years before when they didn't replace Dejan Lovren and how badly that stung them we saw how poorly they left short in midfield last year they can't make another gamble like that. They need to bring in another centre back just to cover themselves. And you think Nat Phillips is probably going to go. Seth Vandenberg's going to go. Reese Williams already left on loan. You're leaving yourself with what Billy Cometio, who's fifth choice at the moment. I need a more senior option there. And even if it's someone like Levy Cobble, who's only had a, seen, a season of senior football, hasn't played week in week out, it's still a step in the right direction there for whoever they sign at centre back. It's not only covering that left sided position, who can be like the hybrid left back, left centre back. They're also realistically a long-term replacement for Virgil van Dijk. Mm. Uh, I, I get what you're saying with midfield because you think when we were all starting the summer, you're still stuck in the ways of thinking 4-3-3, that like you want that physical powerhouse midfielder. Like That's why people got so excited about the links with Kefra and Taram because yeah. he just seemed to tick those boxes. But then Man City haven't really had a player like that since Yaya Torre. And they, this is the formation they play. You think when they have their number 10s is their number 8s, but their number 10s at the same time. This is what Liverpool's signings are still looking to do. Uh, Sabosai, like his uh, ratings for like covering distance, you know, making all those sprints, pressing, winning the ball back. They were brilliant in the Bundesliga last year. Mm. McAllister's a player who's good on the ball, works hard as well. It's this different approach. They're still tall lads. They're just not those big, muscular hench midfielders that you maybe expected Liverpool to have a physical box to box in the four three three, but when you do need them to be a bit more creative, to maybe have an eye for goal, it's another uh, way for Liverpool to threaten sides, and it did look so effective last year. Like offensively, there was no issues with this formation. Yeah, like Curtis Jones was scoring goals. Yeah, a few teething problems. Henderson on the right, but it was obvious that a new midfielder would come in and take that position. Trent was brilliant in that deeper role, and it got a bit of life back in Fabinho. The issue was defensively for Liverpool. It's like, is this a position Andy Robertson can actually do? Uh, Canate is needing to adjust to his position. There's still gaps in for teams to get in behind them. There's still spaces that teams can exploit. A full preseason to work on that fine tune it, get the teething problems out of the system, should make it a, a much stronger position. Midfield wise, probably do need another defensive player. Like if you go into the season and Fabinho, you're relying on him to be your number six, and you're relying on him to be back to his best otherwise you're turning to Pesetic who is still a kid in the man's body he's not been part of the group training yet because he's still feeling his way back Henderson obviously been question marks whether his legs have still got it personally I thought he did well for England in the, the international break yeah. he showed he's still got something left in him he's not just someone you can completely write off but you do feel like you need a more natural number six to be an understudy to Fabinho um, maybe that could be Pesetic long term but it still helps to have that other option but the centre back, as I said at the start, that that is the main one. You can't have four for three because one injury and you're leaving yourself so short. And when you've got the injury problems of Matip, the injury problems of Gomez, who's short of confidence, short of form. Van Dijk's not at his absolute best anymore. Well, he's maybe not fragile, but he's still not at the absolute peak of condition he was two, three years ago. And Canate had a number of injuries last year as well that they just got to have bring in that extra protection. So come August, September, we're not saying the exact same things we were saying last August and September when the Liverpool squad has got so many holes in it because so many players have been struck down by injury. Mm. I think that is a fair and, and, and fundamental point, isn't it, Gorsley, about what remains to be done now. And let, let's move on to, on to Carwell and stay with the, the, the defensive situation. What, what do you think the pitches that Liverpool could potentially make <clears> him at this point? Because, you know, he's, he's spoken out about 
what he wants, which is game time and minutes. Yeah. You know, he's saying, yeah. I'm at the age and the stage now where I need to be playing. Pochettino's going to hold talks with him, isn't he, about his, his potential role at his current club. But do you think do you think there is a route to getting what he wants at Liverpool straight away this season? Or would he, if, if Liverpool did manage to get a deal done for him, would he have to be patient? He'd it, 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 have to be patient, but... I don't think it's patience in terms of him waiting a full season before he's, he's getting games regularly. I think, I think Liverpool do stick with that formation. It's it's tailor made for him on the on the left of a back three. He can bring it out to the fence, knowing he's got the coverage of of a Van Dijk and a Canate behind him. Very comfortable in possession, is he? Left footed defender. Um, you had a, a superb European Championships. You obviously gave away the penalty in stoppage time in the final, but that was a little bit harsh. Yeah. Obviously. They missed it anyway, and England went on to win the tournaments, having not conceded a goal, and, and he was the kind of rock that held it all together. So, yeah, he's someone who Liverpool really like. Um, I mean, the thing that works against him is the fact that he, he's only got 17 Premier League appearances to his name. Liverpool generally, when they're spending big money on a player, look at someone who's played between 150 and 200, which is, I think, was the case for Van Dijk, certainly the case for. There's a buzz line and McAllister. Um, I think you've probably gone through all of the players that have been bought the last few years and there will be similar sorts of, um, of profiles. But it's not necessarily a, a um, you know, the, the deal breaker because Liverpool signed Joe Gomez at 18, didn't he? And that he yeah, went straight into the first team and was, was playing games initially as a left back under Brendan Rodgers. But um, someone who, who Liverpool do like, um, the question is, doesn't seem to be many alternatives, does it, at the moment, in terms of that centre-back profile that we're looking at. Obviously, they will have the names that we won't totally be aware of, but certainly with the midfielders, we've been aware of, of quite a few this summer, but at the moment, it's almost like if they don't bring someone in, they're, they're comfortable enough without it, but they ideally would like to. So, yeah, it'll be an interesting one to, to, to see on that score. I just think... <clears throat> he's someone who would play at Liverpool, but I don't think he's going to be playing 50 times next season if he does come in. But at the moment, Chelsea hold all the cards, don't they? Obviously, Brighton are interested as well, and I suppose he's going to sit down and speak to Pochettino when he gets back to Cobham and take it from there. But um, yeah, I think Chelsea certainly holding the cards at the moment. That was what I was going to ask you about, Theo. I mean, what, what do you think is the way home for Liverpool to potentially try and get this deal done this summer. I mean, it feels to me like, a bit like when Joe Rimmer wants a brew in here and he, <laughs> he kicks up a stink. Do, do you need the player to almost now be the one who says to Chelsea, you know, I'm not happy with my situation here, but, you know, to try and essentially force for a move? Because it does feel like, you know, Liverpool could be priced out of this if there isn't some movement that, that helps them elsewhere. Yeah, I think it all comes down to what gets said in these talks between Cole and Pochettino, how well they go and if they're on the same yeah. page for what actually happens this season. Like There was the talk from Chelsea that they were moving on Koulibaly mm. so they could give him more to game time, give him some opportunities. But they've still got a lot of centre-backs at that club. Like It's a mess of a squad when you look at who they have moved on and who they still need to move on. They're just throwing it all at a wall and hoping that a pitch emerges for them. Yeah. So Pochettino's got his work cut out there. Like long term, there is a place at Chelsea for Levy Cole in the future because you think Thiago Silva is what? Is he 38, 39? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not going to go on forever. Uh, I think Shalaba, he's someone that been, who's been linked with an exit just because he's one of those homegrown players that will save him on FFP. Both the Saudis have saved him on FFP anyway. But he's like, he's someone you could see as a first choice Chelsea centre back. But it's whether he's willing to be patient. I think he said after the final, he just wants to play. Yeah, so it's fair it's enough. The yeah. opportunities that he's going to get. Like Chelsea cannot offer him. European football this year so it's what League Cup FA Cup that's it if they go on a deep runs unless he breaks into that Premier League starting team and without getting their squad up here and going through every single centre back I still wouldn't say he's going to be first choice for them whereas at Liverpool like look at Canate in his first season he didn't play that often in the Premier League I think in his first year didn't make too many starts it was reserved for the Champions League wasn't yeah. it more than anything like mm. he started the FA Cup semi-final didn't he he had um, yeah, he, scored, yeah. he came in big in those final appearances he started the Champions League final so it's about managing them carefully like Liverpool's formation at the moment Cole can be like their Nathan Ake you know he's left back but he's left centre back yeah. as that alternative to Robertson he probably frees you up to let Simicas go if he wants to go elsewhere because he can be that makeshift reserve and he's still got a few youngsters there uh, but he can also be in the, that number 
in a defensive two, and there are going to be opportunities in Europa League. Like you can't imagine Virgil Van Dijk's going to play all six Europa League no, group games. Surely not. Same as you can't expect all the senior players like Salah or that to play in those games. League Cup, FA Cup. Like he's still a young player. It takes time. Like he didn't actually play that much for Brighton last year. Seventeen appearances, so, not half a mm, season, isn't it? Really, it's respectable, mm. but you'd expect that a little bit more. But it's he's a Liverpool fan, I think, or his like his parents are. So he's got that affinity with the club. So it depends what he wants to do, how that conversation with Pochettino goes and what he sees. Like we've seen it with Mason Mount. It doesn't matter what Chelsea want, what the manager wants. If the player decides, yeah, I'm not having this, then Chelsea will look to sell because they won't want him to go for peanuts at the end of his contract. Like there is an option on this contract for Chelsea to give him an extra year, but he has to reach a certain number of appearances in that. And it's like, well, can they guarantee him that at this stage? It doesn't look like it. But at the same time, at this time, it's still hard to see it being a deal that Liverpool can absolutely get done. But we were saying mm. the same about Spossley. Yeah. Spossley a week ago, two it's weeks true. ago. I find the idea that Chelsea don't sell to rivals is a bit overblown as well. Maybe it's true of other clubs in that top six, but certainly Chelsea does some. You know, they've sold Kovacic to City, mm. Havertz to Arsenal, Mount to, to United. So they're not averse to selling you know, a, um, a, a good player to, uh, to a top six rival. So I think that's something to, to keep an eye on as well. Mm. It's a good point, that I shouldn't consider that Liverpool are pretty much the only one left that they haven't yeah, flogged yeah. to yet. So, we can yeah, we'll get you right off top then. <laughs> big, big clubs only. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll move on to Lavia then, who's obviously the other one who, who very much does seem of interest. And come to you first on this course. Do you, does this feel, simple question, does it feel like the more doable deal? Between him and Carwell? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, in terms of Southampton probably under a bit more pressure to sell than Chelsea are, aren't they? Even with. Chelsea's FFP restrictions and, and whatever else, but I think you mentioned earlier about kicking up a stink to, to get out of your your terms. I think Lavi will probably have to do something similar. Mm. Um, he doesn't want to be playing in the Championship, does he, for the season after a, a breakthrough in the Premier League? Uh, I think he played 29 times for Southampton last season, one of the few success stories that he had um, in terms of he recruited so many who hadn't had any Premier League experience and it massively backfired on them but he was probably one of the, the leading lights I think the issue now at the moment is the price tag I just, I just don't think yeah. they're prepared to go anywhere near close to 50 million for someone who's 19 years of age and only had 29 Premier League experiences you know it, it comes back to that point I was making there about the kind of the surety that Liverpool prefer in terms of the profile of a player when they're coming in for you know upwards of 25 to 30 million they want someone who's been there and done it at a certain age almost. Lavia has not. Um, no slight on him, it's the fact that he's only 19. But I think Southampton, knowing that City have that buyback clause next year, I think that's maybe emboldening mm. them a little bit. I think that he can demand top money for Lavia now and, and City will be back at the table next summer, even though that's not necessarily a guarantee, is it? Um, I wonder the appetite of City to go and get Lavia in 12 months if he's just had a year in the Championship. Mm-hmm. Particularly at forty million, they, they might be trying to get him for a little bit less than that. So um, I think it's just a bit of a watching brief at the moment for Liverpool. Someone who they have kind of checked out behind the scenes and whatever else, as as you'd expect them to do, really. You know, given the clubs, the size of Liverpool and the type of players you'd be looking to attract this summer. But at the moment, no real development in that one. But we do know that Liverpool do work fast when there are developments. Mm, no, that's certainly the case, isn't it? We've seen that time and time again. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's the key point that Gorsi makes the theory, isn't it? About how hard it is to put a value on this player. Because not only, as, as Paul says, is, is there is there is a bit of limited experience there. But I think that, in turn, for the way Liverpool recruit, there's, there's less data for them to really consider You know what, what this lad's ceiling is, what, what he's truly worth. But the argument I would make there, though, is my, my one concern with the, the, the new structure in the box midfield, I think the right-hand side, if you're saying first choice there over time is potentially going to be Salah to Soboslai to you know Trent, um, Kanate as well, goes on the right side of the back. The, the left-hand side, I do wonder whether it's just a little bit more gettable for, for an opposition that you, know, you can target it without someone who's got real physical presence. And as, as we've said, you know, perhaps Fabinho will really kick on again this season. You know, he's, he's, one, he's one of the first back, wasn't he, pre-season training? And he did end the campaign well. But do you think there is there is even more value on someone who could occupy that that deeper slot next to Trent and w- with energy, with legs, with, with youth, with vigour? 
Yeah, I, you can see the argument for signing someone like Lavia. Like you'd have to have faith in Fabinho to still have another two, three years left in the locker at that elite level without a drop off to go. This is the player we want. Someone who can be that gradual replacement mm. for him. But it still doesn't sit right with me when Besetic is there. Like Besetic is being portrayed as this number six. I think he's only a year younger. Considering Southampton have been relegated, if Lavia stays with Southampton, you'd imagine by the end of this season, Besetic has played more times in the Premier League than him, or mm. at least at that highest Probably. level. So it's like, well, if you're going to go with this younger option, why don't you just have faith with the one you rate who's already within your ranks? Like, it's a bit different, say, if they're going for Kone, who's uh, had a few more years in the locker, He's a bit more physical presence. He's a bit taller. He's mm. got that experience. And yeah, he's not used to Premier League football, but it's someone you could comfortably say, yep, go into that team now. Like Lavia, while he's had that season with Southampton, there's still a side that were comfortably bottom of the Premier League by an absolute mile. Now, that's not a slant on him. That was the whole team failing there. We saw the, the managerial changes seemingly week after week at one point and it just didn't work. And maybe he's one of those players you put in a better team and it would be so much better for him. Um, obviously you'd have less work to do if you put them in a Liverpool squad you'd like to think uh, Man City lurking it's like well do they go back in for him is he a player that they just signed so then he can sell for more like, he needs to do something more on the stage to be this 40-50 mm. million pound player um, I think Liverpool don't tend to do that on those sorts of players like they paid less for a McAllister for a Canate for a Diaz for a Gakpo uh, for Right through most of them, really. I think Nunes is one of the only few who's actually been above that three recently, and all those players have done so much more than him. Like he's a highly rated player, he's talented, um, but he's still that question mark against it for me. Like one thing that does come into it, and we've written this piece so many times, is Liverpool would need to sell to bring in players, and they've got to spin plates to make room for new signings. Now they've got those two signings in, and at least with your Lavias and your Cole Wolves, you don't need to register them Premier League action because yeah. they're still under twenty one. And they're homegrown, so they're like association trained, so they'd fill the places of like a Milner and Oxlade Chamberlain in the European squad. It's not as a case of we need to get rid of X, Y, and Z just to bring players in, but it's still one where maybe they'll pull a surprise, maybe there's someone else to emerge as a candidate. But you feel for Besetic if, having had that season, they go and go 50 million on a player who's basically going to take his position. Mm. I, d- I do think it, it kind of points to Liverpool's future proof, and though the fact that they're targeting. A 19-year-old midfielder and a 20-year-old centre-back. Uh, looking at the squad now, they've significantly reduced the age, haven't they? I think there's a piece on it yesterday. Liverpool started the game against Fulham last season. Started the season, 2-2 draw. The average age was something like 30 years and, and, and 7 or something like that. It was Liverpool's oldest team in the Premier League since 1994. Um, a week early in the Community Shield, it was the oldest team since the 50s. Um, but now, looking at it, Milner's gone. Um... Firmino's gone, and the, you know McAllister and Zabozlai are 24 and 22. You've got the likes of Trent, 24, Canate, Nunes, they're all 24. Even Jota and Diaz, 26. Yeah. You know they're entering the prime years, aren't they? Um, Realistically, it's only be what two players over the age of 30. You'd say in the, the strongest eleven at the moment. Van Dijk mm-hmm. and Salah, and I suppose they'd be looked at as almost unique, wouldn't they, for for what they're able to contribute and what they've done over the years. Um, so I do get the feeling that they are looking to reduce the age significantly and looking towards kind of the next great Liverpool team. So one other player, Theo, who obviously he himself and I think Klopp would have high hopes that he could be part of Liverpool's future and, and present is is Curtis. Curtis Jones had a fantastic summer on a personal level with England under-21s. But there has been this bit of debate around him, you know, specifically online, with a little bit of polarisation as to whether, you know, some fans are getting a bit too carried away and there's a little bit too much hype, or others saying, you know, well, look what he did last season, he was great and he can challenge the, the new lads. Where do you stand on that? I mean, is it one where, as ever, the truth is somewhere in between? Yeah, it's definitely somewhere in between, isn't it? Like, um, we've written a few pieces about him recently. I think at the start of the tournament, you had uh, fans kicking off going, why are you you're praising him? You want to sign these players, you don't want to have Curtis Jones instead of them. And then come at the end of the tournament, all the people who were saying how good Curtis Jones were were getting louder and louder. Like he, he was named in the team of the tournament. He was man of the match in the semi-final and the final. Like a month ago, Liverpool were looking at your Tarams, your Kones, your Gabri Vegas, your Ryan Gravenberches. But the player within their ranks who's got more Premier League experience than all of them has just outshone them all on that European stage. Yeah. And while some of them are raw players, a bit unproven still, he's just looking so calm and confident. 
Uh, it's easy, maybe, I'm not going to call it a bandwagon, but, you know, to get a little bit carried away, but 11 good games, and it's like, oh, Curtis Jones is this great midfielder, but he is still a very talented boy. Like he's had a couple of poor seasons in terms of injuries where it's held him back and he's had to wait to get that opportunity. He's got to earn the manager's trust back, get used to his body again because it was like growing pains and all those sorts of issues. But then he gets that run of games and he finds some rhythm. And he's saying, this is the player we saw at academy level. Yeah. Like it didn't matter what position he was playing at academy level. He was that leader. He was the naturally gifted star. You could put him left wing, he'd cut inside and score worldies. You could put him deep in midfield role. He was threading through balls and setting everyone up. And we're now seeing at the first team level. Like, he's probably, for me, the next one on the list, isn't he? In terms of, you've got your starting three midfielders. He is that next one that goes into the team when one of them's unavailable mm-hmm. on form. He's got to build on it, of course. Like we've said this on podcasts before, 11 games it seems like a small number. It's a third of a season. But this is now three, four months of really good form. He goes in... Yeah, he's playing catch-up, but he has a good pre-season, starts the season well, and then, like, yes, he is part of this now. Like, you think of ages of players. Harvey Elliott is still a raw youngster. He's yeah. a very talented youngster, but he's going to have ups and downs. He's still 20. Curtis Jones is now 22, going on to 23. He's not an under-21s player anymore. He's got to be registered in the squad. He is a proper first-team player, and he is proving that. And it's just taking those next steps to show it's not just that little run of form. Like, this is the player we can get and see now. This is what he can offer to the Liverpool side. And as we said earlier in the podcast, if Sebastian takes that little bit of time to settle, he is the one you're turning to to start because he is the one who's ready to take that next step mm. when Henderson's getting older, when Thiago's getting older. And you just want to see more from him. But I think everyone was really happy to see his end of the season because it's been so hard for him with those injuries. And he is a really likeable player. Like, you do any interviews with the academy players past or present and they'll all say he was the best one he was the one who set the standards in training yeah. who had the natural ability but worked his backside off to get where he is and while he's not a Steven Gerrard or a Trent Alexander-Arnold not many academy players have actually stuck around he is that next bracket who is sticking around and that is something that should be celebrated and set as a role model for the next generation to come through and emulate yeah he's very much part of this midfield revamp going forwards uh, you just hope he does keep taking these steps and keep to continuing to silence his doubters. Mm. I think that's it, isn't it? Of course, you know, the first thing Jones will be thinking of is just avoid injuries because yeah. we've all seen his level, as Theo said, you know, the way he ended last season. I suppose what I broaden this out to, to ask you about him, him and Elliot, what would you see as being a good season, like a good next step for them going into this campaign? Because it like, kind of feels like they they swapped over last season didn't you know Elliot was almost ever present early on and then faded out the team a little bit you know for, yeah. for various reasons yeah. and then Jones really kind of took the mantle didn't he and as Theo said and this place you know what, what do you think the, the next target would be for the pair of them yeah with Jones when, when I mentioned the players who got injured in, in pre-season before he, he was another one wasn't he he got that weird yeah. stress fracture reaction thing the um, picked up in the closing stages of the community shield and he was still dealing with it pretty much right throughout until about March, April time. Um, so, I, I mean, I think for him, like Theo says, 11 games, 11 games in a row is a decent sample size at the end of the season. He's just got to continue on that path of, of staying fit and influencing games when he's involved. Um, I don't think he's going to be a starter next season because hopefully we'll see more of Thiago Alcantara and I think McAllister's going to play on that left side as well, but Certainly, when they're playing that kind of new sweep midfield that enables him to move further forward into the left wide areas where he kind of made his name as an academy player, I guess it's just staying fit and showing more of that form on, on a consistent basis, and then that would be considered a good step. Uh, for Elliot, it's a little bit more difficult because I think he was almost ran into the ground a little bit of times last season. Yeah. I think the Chelsea game in April was the only one he hadn't been involved in, and that was, you know, right at the back end of the season. You know, that was the start of that eleven game unbeaten run, actually. So he probably, he probably put into the final line a bit too often last season at a time when collectively the performances were dipping, and it was difficult for a young player to to emerge into that midfield and, and show what he can do as he's still adapting to a relatively new role because he's obviously played. His name's a youngster on the left of a front three, didn't he? So, um, I guess, just more of the kinds of highs that we've seen him last season. You know, Manchester United at home, Spurs away. Um, Spurs at home. Spurs at home, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, just more of that on a, on a bit more of a 
consistent basis when he's in the team. So I guess, you know, it's just what you'd expect from young players um, as they, t- they take the next step. It's just a case of showing their best form on a more consistent, regular basis. And, and that would be considered big steps forward for, for, better, for the better of them. I think you look at them, they are different profiles, aren't they? Like one thing that struck us when Jones got into the side is he looks more of a man now. He's that bit taller. He's physical. Yeah, filled the stream. Elliot's also. still... It doesn't look like he's going to have another growing spurt. Like this looks like this is his height, and while he can be a bit muscular and maybe be a, a Shakiri power cube in the future, <laughs> he's still a bit diminutive. And now that doesn't mean he's not going to be this future midfielder. Like you only need to look at Man City for how they have those playmakers deeper, and it works for them. But he still needs to maybe finally nail down a role for what he is. Silence another one who needs to silence the doubt is like, yes, I can be a long term midfielder for Liverpool. Or is he the long-term replacement for Mohamed Salah on the right-hand side? Uh, is it eight senior midfielders at the moment for Liverpool, and that's not including Trent? Yeah. Um, realistically, you've got he's what Thiago's ahead of him, Henderson's ahead of him, the three starters are ahead of him, Jones is now ahead of him. Like it's a big ask for him to get opportunities ahead of them to start. But there are going to be there's going to be rotation in the cup games and the Europa League, and he's still probably the one who's more likely to get you a goal off the bench or an assist off the bench when he starts delivering like that on that level consistently but we've also got to remember the Cup of Nations is coming up Salah's going to be disappearing for a month that could be his chance to really stake a claim second half of the season same as we saw Jones do this year just gone I, I don't think we're at that stage now where we can expect a full consistent season for Elliot where he's delivering week in week out but if he has the, a few starts in Europe and he's getting a couple of goals as he did in the Champions League group stages of course yeah, yeah. makes an impact as a senior player despite being so young in the Cup games and then just makes the odd uh, impact off the bench in the Premier League or comes in to start those big games, then that's another good season for him. And it's really two, three years down the line where you're really assessing him going, right, you need to take that next step and be an established starter for Liverpool. Mm, absolutely. I think you're spot on. Lastly then, I'll come to you on this one first, Kirsty. Just a, a few words on, on Trent, his situation, yeah. his summer, his next steps. I mean, some of the stuff he's been up to to, to prepare, not for, for kick-off, just to prepare for pre-season. I think it just speaks to the level of professionalism. I mean, it's almost like he's gone through his own personal Olympics of all these different <laughs> different disciplines, and yeah. you know he's looking Look in great shape. One, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But th- there is almost that that little clock starting to tick as well, isn't it? Because there's two years left on his current deal. W- where do you see things? You know, where are they at for him at the moment, just in a general sense? Yeah, I think it's. I think heading into the, to the new season with all the different areas of intrigue and interest and whatever, I think Trent is probably top of that list. You know, where's he going to play? Is Klopp going to stick with the formation? Is Trent now a fullback? Is he still a fullback? Is he a midfielder? You know, it's going to be fascinating to see what they do with him. I thought he was a breath of fresh air the final couple of months of last season, playing in that more central role every time he got the ball. You know, on the edge of his sheath, thinking this is a chance, no matter where he was on the pitch. Yeah, still only twenty four. Believe it or not, after all these years that he's been a senior member of the, the first team. With Milner gone, Van Dijk's going to take over that role as official vice captain. Trent kind of moves up the pecking order in the, the unofficial kind of leadership group off the pitch. He's never made any secrets of the fact that he wants to be the Liverpool captain for the long term, so that's another kind of progressive step mm. in that direction. Um, two years left on his contract now, which is not, you know, it's not panic stations, but it's certainly something that's going to come on the horizon in the next eight to nine to ten months for Liverpool because you don't want to be getting to the last year of, of that contract because even we've seen with you know players who are at the Boyle club sometimes that loyalty can be taken for granted for a bit and then you're in a bit of a sticky situation here. I don't think Liverpool will want to get anything close to that so contract situation will be there at some stage um, so yeah it's going to be an interesting season for him I just got the feeling that he's you know going off his, his pre-season work He's been in Portland, Oregon at the Under Armour Innovation Hub um, working with a fitness fitness coach who's kind of di- their director of fitness. He's got some grand title, I can't remember what it is exactly, but he used to be a fitness coach at Newcastle and he's been working one-to-one with him on certain sessions designed to kind of build up his endurance and his conditioning and his stamina and all that kind of stuff. So just get the feeling that he's ready to go. Obviously, day one to day for him, isn't it? Back at Kirby. Uh, and it's going to be a fascinating season for him. So... Yeah, looking forward to seeing him next season as always and um, still a fabulous player to watch, isn't he? So, yeah, I, I just think that that contract situation will be one that Liverpool will certainly be keeping more than an eye on it as the season progresses and 
he gets closer towards that 300 game milestone I think he's about 27 games off at the moment so um, unbelievable to think that of a player of 24 This is it Theo isn't it to have that level of experience and across multiple competitions I mean his, his trophy cabinet must be full back home mm-hmm. you know almost now already at, at such a tender age but do you get the impression on and off the pitch I would say that he's ready to take another step up even and, and assume more responsibility for Liverpool yeah, I do. Like, I think a lot of Liverpool players last year, or maybe when things weren't going well, were sulking a little bit. You know, they'd have digs when they came out in public about people criticising yeah, them. Yeah. Mm. Van Dijk's probably one that comes to mind, but Trent was another one. But then he just looked so more relaxed when he was in that midfield role and he could show his talents again. It's like, now come at me. What do you think now? Like, he certainly struck a very different uh, demeanour when he was playing so much better. Didn't, didn't hear any of it, did you, the last few months of the season? No, no exactly. Gary no. Neville, you know, long ago, there was none of that. <laughs> Um, but in, when he was taking this role, being central to the team, and like while he was getting a lot of assists from right back, he saw, he did grow in stature, didn't he? He seems like, oh, I am the main player here. Yeah. Like, he's never going to be, or at this stage, a talisman in the same way as Mohamed Salah, but everything went through him. So he was given that responsibility on the pitch, and he, he grew as a result of that off the pitch as well. Like Having those knocks, which obviously did affect the players mentally last year, will put them in better stead to deal with them in future. And he's learned from that. He's going to be stronger from that. But he's reaching these peak years now. Like 24, he's still a couple of years off absolute peak level. Like, But this is when Steven Gerrard started putting in, yes, you're an absolute world-class player now. Yeah. You're going to be one of the best in our history. And you almost take Trent for granted because he's been in that starting eleven, doing it week after week since he was 18 years old, winning absolutely everything. But he is someone who could be easily recognised in that bracket when it does come to retire which isn't going to be for another 10, 15 years, which is remarkable in itself. With regards to the, the contract on him, I think it's part of Liverpool's forward thinking as well. Like The fact that when they were giving out all those new deals to Robertson, Fabinho, Alisson, Trent actually had one of the shorter contracts. But like, They knew there was no point giving him that longer one because they'd have to come back to the negotiating table in the first yeah. place to give him new status. Like He's already one of the higher owners in the club, but now you're entering your peak years, you're going to be a future captain of this club. You're going to get another a pay uh, bump up here. So um, he's got that incredible status already in this squad and it's just going to rise. And as your Hendersons get older, your Thiago's get older, Salah, Van Dijk, he is emerging as that leading Liverpool player, that leader in the camp who everyone will just follow and emulate. He'll be that star and he's still such a, a modest likeable lad he had his bottom lip out a little bit at times last season <laughs> but he's emphatically uh, emphatically come back and silenced any doubters shown his abilities and you're looking forward to just seeing him join playing his football again because that's not something we saw every week last year but we did during the final two months of the campaign mm-hmm. we did when he was away with England and you know he's just going to want to silence everyone once and for all challenge City for those titles again get back into the Champions League and show that it was just one year blip and right off Liverpool at your peril Absolutely. Very, very exciting. And there's a nice interview with Trent, which is uh, on the Echo website now, where he's talking about his excitement at playing with the, I think he calls them dream players, mm-hmm. of, at McAllister and uh, Sobersly. So plenty to look forward to uh, for the Reds. And that will do us for today. So yeah, hope uh, Dominic and Alexis have had a good first day. If you got nothing to do tonight, stick the Blood Red podcast on. And we will be back on Friday for our next episode. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo.